Thank you for joining me on Talking Dark Live. Um, Very excited to be here, thank you. First we've got to do a welcome to country. Do you want to do it? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Gadigal people, the Eora and Darug nations. Um, we are on stolen land. Sovereignty has never been ceded. Genocide is an ongoing process on these lands. Uh, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Mm. Nice. Thank you so much for the plan. Oh, you're so welcome. <laughs> well deserved. Um, so, I've already interviewed you, and in that interview, we covered empathy and care in kind of broad strokes. And I'm going to put that in a link underneath because, um, you know, I think people really should watch that first before this video because today I want to get a bit deeper into it now that I've read your stunning paper. Um, but to summate as briefly as we can for the people, uh, your still life work explores what it means to create pictures of your everyday environment um, in present time and self and through the still life genre, what attention to non-human objects generates in terms of ethics and care. Hmm. That's good, you can stop me if uh, I butcher anything. Sounds great. But uh, I like the quotes you had to open mm. the paper. It really set the scene well. And the Japanese guy's a bit long, but I've got Sezan <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, people think a sugar bowl has no physiognomy or soul, but that changes every day here. You have to take them, cajole them. What's that word? I've never seen that word before. Cajole them? Cajole them. Uh, so to, to reassure and to uh, care for them mm -hmm. and to... Yes, okay. offer them emotional support. No physiognomy or soul, but that changes every day here. You have to take them, cajole them, these glasses, these dishes, they talk amongst themselves, they whisper interminable secrets. Fruits love to have their portrait painted. They sit there and apologise for changing colour. How nice is that? Oh, it's gorgeous. Um, but did you want to expand on that a little bit in terms of what your sure. paintings are trying to do? Yeah, so I think when I found that quote, it really struck a chord um, because I've always felt that the, the subjects of my work and the objects that I surround myself, myself with um, are active in the space, that they're not 
um, you know, that they're not just passive objects. And I think, you know, I think a lot of us know that, that objects carry energy with them and, you know, that they affect us um, in our day to day, but it's not, not something that is maybe encouraged to kind of really consider what what that might actually mean like what is it i think it's something everyone would have yeah. engaged with at some point like most people have had stuffed animals and stuff but there comes a point where yeah. you sort of maybe told to cut that instinct off yeah i think you know i think stuffed animals is a do you want to check that i think i might have to check that For the light or pastel colors, mixing the colorant into the base paint is so simple, a child can do it. Just press all the colorant from the tubes. You and I think that you do a lot of art that's like focused on yourself because you are a fashion designer. So you kind of like work from your own body, and I don't know if you meant to do that. Okay, well this is fucking bullshit. I'm sorry, but like, I spent so much time on these fucking projects. This is fucking shit. I fucking hate you. I'm this fucking class. Action. Um, what are we talking about? Stuffed animals. Yeah, so I think, yeah, that's a really nice point because I think as children we are really attached to our objects and our things. You know, it's one of the ways that we start to understand who we are as people by the things that we, you know, we carry with us and we take around with us. Um, and yeah, I think giving giving time and energy back to the things that we choose to surround ourselves with has always been important to me and the way that I have shaped my sense of self and I've never seen them as inert. Um, they've always been players, you know, and I guess that's... You know, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's why the, you know, the Cezanne quote really struck a chord because, you know, he talks about them as if they're actors, as if they're players in his life, because that's what they are. Mm. And, and that's definitely how I see mine. And it's not, it's not necessarily, I think it can very quickly become just a, like, an anthropomorphic kind of, um, you know, conversation. But it, it's kind of more, anthropomorphism is very much about projecting your own kind of image onto them, mm. onto the objects. But I suppose what I try to do, of course I do that, you know, but I, I think also what I try to do is actually listen to what the object itself might want mm. and what it, you know, what it does in the space and, you know, yeah, whether it is apologizing for color, changing color or, you know, whether it really wants to be next to this other thing, you know. And it can sound, sound a bit sort of fanciful, I think, sometimes. And I'm sure there are lots of people that don't relate to that, that kind of, um, you know. But I think, I think most people would relate to objects in their lives being of significance whether it's emotional significance or, you know, um, uh, just a practical reliance upon them, like, you know, they're important, they're of import, and they deserve time and attention. Yeah, I think that's important what you're saying too, because, I mean, when you're talking about the actual interaction with these objects, it is very easy to anthropomorphize it, but they have an existence outside of that. Like, I grew up with my jolly the giraffe, and, He's away on a shelf just because I've got Alfie now and he'll probably tear it to shreds. 
but I get comfort knowing that Jolly's there. Totally, and he's yeah. got an entire existence that lives beyond my childish mm. anthropomorphic play with him. Yeah. Mm. You know, he he is there when you're in the room and when you're not. Mm. You know, the, and there's energy in that room just because there might not be a human presence. Mm. There is non-human presence, you know, which is, you know, we're so used to prioritizing the human of everything. Mm. So I think, you know, trying to find a kind of balance between that is what I strive to do. I'm fully aware that, you know, well, you know, I'm fully aware I'm also not interested in removing my presence entirely. Mm. You know, I would be making very different work if my presence and my interaction and my perspective didn't feel integral to the experience, right? Because mm. I am speaking from a, you know, from self. Uh, but it's about sharing space and allowing myself to be overcome and affected, affected by things outside of myself that might be non-human. Mm. Um. Which kind of leads into this quote where I say it's a question of basically just hand fisted thrown some of your words in here. But you say there are moments of connection to other bodies for which words cannot do justice. Moments that while personal are connected to a universal empathic experience. Experiences that can bring about love, care and honesty sometimes to specific things but other times to everything. Um, and because these sensations and all their intensity evade language, one might turn to art. Um, so on that really nice um, section, I'm curious to know how your kind of broader ethics of care mm. affects your painting practice. Yeah, so I think I'll quickly uh, acknowledge um, yeah, the use of universal or universality. Uh, I think in my uh, previous interview with you, I, um, I said that that can be a problematic term. And I use it because I don't have a better alternative. I think yeah. I pretty much verbatim, that's what I say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that still stands. Yeah, yeah, I, haven't, yeah. I haven't kind of come up with a better term for it. I just want to put that out there. Um, and I think what I really, one of the conclusions or near conclusions that I came to through this project was that, you know, the ethics of care um, is where my painting practice comes from. It's not the other way around. My painting practice doesn't exist without my kind of interest and desire to live by the ethics of care. Um, and of course, you know, uh, is good? Yeah, all good. I just, I check on the time <laughs> periodically. Oh, right, okay. That'll you shut know, off automatically stop. after. Okay. Um, oh, yes, right. <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's right. Um, yeah. yeah, so the ethics of care, um, you know, including, it includes uh, giving time and space to, to things, to care for ourselves as well. Um, you know, uh, attention and time are one of the most valuable things that we as individuals can offer something else or someone else. Uh, so that's a really kind of key thing in the ethics of care. And um, yeah, I think, you know, my painting comes from a desire to connect meaningfully with those people, those things outside of myself, the world beyond me, um, which is, you know, living through feminism, which is living through, you know, the feminist uh, values of, of care um, and, you know, fairness and truth and honesty um, and compassion, uh, empathy, of course, you know, the, and that, and that's, those are values that I've been brought up with, you know, uh, in my family and in the social 
circle that my family existed within like that has always been of you know key import it's always been you know implicit I maybe wasn't having explicit conversations about feminism and ethics of care until I was a little bit older, but you know I was always brought up with that that kind of mentality, mm. and to try and you know, I you know as far as I can remember, like I've always had quite a a clear idea of you know my moral standpoint, the ethics that I am living by. That's not to say that I wasn't doing silly stuff or like you know no, but you, behaving you poorly as someone that you know would have always been very strong in what she believed in yeah and i think i have been so i've always known when i've done something wrong that i have done <laughs> something <laughs> really wrong <laughs> and um anyway so <laughs> you know all of that pre-existed my painting practice mm. and um and so it makes sense that my painting would attempt to incorporate those ideas and attempt to align itself with the ethics of care, with empathy, mm. as a core principle of the way that we interact with the world around us. Mm. Let's take a quick break. Yeah. I'll switch over the camera. The most fun part of this whole painting technique is washing the brush. So let's wash the brush. We do that with odorless paint thinner. And I have a screen in the bottom of this can so we can scrub the bristles against the screen and the, and the solid material sort of settle to the bottom, keeping the paint thinner relatively clean. And we'll shake it off and then <laughs> just beat the devil out of it. Is this couldn't resist. Huh? You know what? I'm actually tripping pretty hard right now. You're yeah. tripping? Yeah. Very professional. Indeed. Very nice. Thank you. I love them. Oh, very good. Oh, it's really. Do you mind if I just finish this point? <laughs> just let me finish. Do you want to clap this time? Action. <laughs> Clap as well, you can turn that on. <laughs> Magic. Alrighty. Um, have I already asked you what Luke wanted to ask? Or yeah. Did we stop? Uh, no, you had you had asked and I just oh, yeah, about yeah, started. Yeah. How yeah. do the conditions of the home shape? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I was saying that it's, uh, you know, it's a really nice question because it wasn't something that I was aware of. I was definitely like, of the mentality that I was useless when it came to working from home <laughs> because I have no self-control. Mm. But the lockdown at the beginning of 2020 where I moved back to Castlemaine to my parents' place and spent four months working in a little shed there. Mm. Little, yeah, shed. It's a very nice shed. It's brief. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, this you know, the lockdown that we've we've come out of not too long ago, um, midway through 2021, uh, both those times were just like ridiculously productive for me. Mm. They were the most productive time that I've had throughout the duration of Masters. Mm. And I think it's just, I really, I'm really able to focus and when I feel like I have no other disruption and that it's purely up to me to organize my time to get into the studio and you know having it at home i can just walk in whenever i feel ready you know i don't have to make a big hoo-ha about getting the train to school or you know i don't even have to get dressed like you know i can just walk into the studio in my jammies and have a sit down you know and i think like that kind of 
having the opportunity to approach the studio, approach painting in a more sort of casual and low-key way mm. was really nice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to not have this kind of, you know, pressure on myself that, okay, now is work time. Mm. Rather, I could warm up to that, you know. I could get into a rhythm and be like, yeah, now is work time, but it just sort of happened because I was messing about, you know. I can go have a cup of tea whenever I want. I can go for a walk in the garden, you know, and it's just like, without any disruption, it was really great. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, something that I talk about in my paper and something that I talked about in the other interview that we did was that, um, and it's something that Elaine Scarry talks about, is um, that beauty, beauty can be found in specificity. And I really took to that because it's in the specific, it's in the attention to detail that we offer our surroundings. It's the attention to detail that I was able to afford my subject that these really nice moments would happen. Mm. And it's kind of, you know, it's in line with what I think painters are often found to say that, you know, it's within the little accidents that the best stuff happens. Mm. And it's kind of those like um, serendipitous moments of minute attention that just would happen in a day because I'd been given it the time, I had energy, I was well rested, mm. um, you know, and the specificity of my space in a space that I felt really comfortable with, you know, the bricks started appearing in my paintings and it was just like something that I ran with because I was having such a good time with it. And, you know, those bricks are my space, you know, that's the wall of my bedroom. Mm. You know, and it was just like it really happened to work for me. Mm. Um, and you know, the the comfort and the familiarity to have a space that I myself had like curated and have complete control over mm. in my flat. Um, you know, that was solely mine, but that was also the home of all my things all these objects, you know, so they also felt comfortable, I think, in that space. Mm. They look very much, you walk in there, and you, you <laughs> see that, yeah, they belong there. Mm. Rather than, you know, them sort of having to travel a bit and be packed up in boxes and then unpacked into a studio that has white walls, that there's no necessarily dis defining characteristic mm. in the space, you know, there's, there's, it's difficult to find those kind of moments of, you know, specificity to mm -hmm. self to you know personal kind of uh ownership or whatever mm -hmm. you know even just what you're saying just those spaces that feel you can feel that it's lived in. You yeah can feel a sense yeah. of time has unfolded yeah. there yeah and like in my paper it addresses something similar in the in alan capro's art and non-art that mm. you know the real world is so beautiful and complex it is more art than art could be mm. And, uh, no, precisely. Yeah. I think that's that's really that's really nice. Mm. You know, I'm not. I think both of us. You know, we're trying to come to terms with the space around us, the the environments we find ourselves in. Um, and you know, I think that's why it's so important that you're engaging with the folk that you keep close to you, um, that you engage with on a regular basis. And similarly for me, it's my space and my, you know, and the objects, mm. yeah. Cool. So, Leslie Harding, in a 2017 essay. <laughs> 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 it's a slow process. <laughs> um, oh. The modern art of painting flowers reinventing the still life. Um, I like what you mentioned about her in what she said about Margaret Preston, Georgia O'Keeffe and Grace Cossington Smith. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, uh, have you never been to the art gallery of New South I mean, Wales? the thing is names are yeah, shocking sure. names. Yeah. No, Good I'm sorry. Faces and fingers. Maybe just edit out that you hadn't heard of that. I mean, like, half of this whole thing is just, like, <laughs> yeah. playing the dude. No, I'm just, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, um, but she yeah. said that, uh, I mean, of course I had to butcher this bit, because I, 
I uh, smashed the still life last time accidentally. Remember that? I, yeah, <laughs> I actually I recently listened to it. Oh, and yeah. oh god, I felt so bad. No, 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 no. But uh, she talks about the domestic, not the domestic genre, the still life genre. I'm definitely going to have to cut this now. But it's regarded as a domestic or a feminine genre mm. in perhaps a demeaning way. But these artists understand this wider dynamic and mm. use the genre to comment back at this mm. society at large. And there's a reference to a phrase, holding the moment. And I wonder mm. if you could elaborate on that and how you want your works to function. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think first, firstly that you know, the domestic, and it's something that Norman Bryson talks about, it's basically the basis of his, you know, um, his essays, uh, looking at the overlooked, um, yeah, easily ignored, we go about our daily basis, uh, a daily business, and we don't actually stop, we don't stop to look at anything, we don't stop to pay attention to the things that, you know, really make up our kind of day to day mm. um, in our in our homes, sure. So, you know, I think there's the importance of acknowledging what it is that, you know, our environments, our, our personal environments, um, you know, I think also the feminine, you know, the feminine has been downtrodden, of course, you know, we live in patriarchy, we live in capitalism. Um, these things, you know, both inform the disregard for the domestic um, and craft and, you know, all sorts. Um, and I think, you know, those three artists, O'Keefe, Cossington Smith and Preston, you know, utilise that. They found the power in that. They found the power in, you know, in their femininity, in their domestic. Um, and they ran with it because it was what they knew. It was what they knew, and so they made work that felt really authentic and really true um, to who they were, you know. And that's, a, you know, I think at least where some of the power in those works come from. Mm. Um, that and, you know, they were fucking great painters. Mm. Excuse my French. Um, so holding the moment, I think, comes back to what I was saying about beauty and specificity. Comes back to... Um, paying attention to things that we might not usually pay attention to um, and it comes it comes back to concepts of care because time is valuable and so we give time to something we give time and attention to something we feel through what it is we're feeling in that moment we try to kind of understand it, maybe intuitively, emotionally, you know, um, and we, yeah, we hold, we hold these moments as moments of significance and of import. It's about paying attention, and it's about allowing ourselves to feel empathy to things other than the person sitting next to us, which is something we've been conditioned to believe is important, especially as women, you know. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's why you know holding the moment's really nice. It also it's nice in a poetic sense. It's nice in that like you know the 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 kind of physicality that can be associated not only with painting but you know with with objects like you know. He is alive, you know, I can hold him and he feels really good, you know, and I want to convey that, that's important. Mm. Feels great. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I think, yeah, there's a, a few different ways that I, I've kind of interpreted that, mm. I suppose. Um, yeah, and I, I've mentioned... I've mentioned beauty a few times, and one of the issues that I was having with my project for like up until the end was that a lot of people were like, where is beauty important? And it's, um, I think, yeah, so I'll just briefly say that, you know, beauty, uh, beauty is all around us. It can be found 
in many things it's you know largely personal i think as mm -hmm. to what we find to be beautiful but it's only through paying attention that we actually come across those moments of beauty mm -hmm. And when we encounter, and it is that, it's an encounter with something beautiful that exists outside of ourselves, it's from that point then we have the decision to take it further. Mm -hmm. So we have an opportunity to devote time or attention to that beautiful thing mm -hmm. um, and to feel what it is we're feeling and to allow ourselves to be affected mm -hmm. by yeah, our, our surroundings. And, and in that, you know, we're engaged, in that we're connected. It's a moment of connection then to something beyond ourself, which I think um, I'm not the first one in your, in your interviews to, you know, Marianne was talking about it. Um, I think Matt was probably also talking about it. These, you know, moments of connection to things beyond us is how we get through our lives. Like, it's, it's what makes us feel you know, grounded in a terrible, what could be a really terrible, terrible place, you know, a terrible world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even in beauty being subjective, like sure beauty is subjective, but in my experience, that attention mm. can only expand your perception of beauty, right? Yeah, totally. And it's, and I think really early on when we were having discussions about our projects in the um, you know, at the beginning of this process, at the beginning of our projects, I was talking very much about, um, you know, putting an empathic foot forward and empathy and our ability to perceive things as beauty, as beautiful, um, you know, it's, they're basically muscles that need to be exercised, you know, because it, it, comes, it comes from, I think, a place of generosity it, and, um, extending generosity and care that's where you know it really comes back to care is you know it's a it's a practice mm. it takes practice mm. the muscles that need to be exercised because it's not in our neoliberal existence it's not what we're told to do you know um and if we are told to do it it's generally really gendered mm. um so, yeah, I think, mm, I think I said it. Cool. Oh, well, that's a good time, isn't it? It's in the hills and the bright blue sky. It's in the quiet lakes with their soft horizons. It's in the fields of ripened grain. It's in the late afternoon. And the clear early morning. It's in unexpected places with sudden bright surprises. It is color, the harp string of beauty the keyboard of mood. <laughs> oh my god, it just choked on water. Oh, I hate that so much. <laughs> oh my god. Maybe you can sink the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the car. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, Mr. Kudu can do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so last question and it actually I forgot how kind of crucial this was to your theory and your practice but you started with restrictive palettes mm. and were looking at colour quite mm. specifically as an important part of this empathic response um, could you extend a bit on the important, like, mm. the role colour serves mm. in, your, in your work? Yeah, so, as I cover in my paper, I didn't realise until I was making bad colour choices. Um, my use of colour, for the most part, has relied on intuition. 
I never had much formal training when it came to you know, palette, whatever, color mixing. I had one shoot with a with a, a teacher in my undergrad at VCA, uh, Colleen, who is a professional color mixer. Yeah. She gave me a really basic palette, and that is what I ran with from you know third year till last year, basically, or you know 20, 2020. Um, and I started using pastels, oil pastels. Uh, color mixing with pastels is very different to paint. You buy colors kind of whole, you know, and you're using the crayon rather than kind of like relying on mixing the hue that you want, um, as you do with paint. Um, I started making bad choices. It was making the pictures look trash. I was like, what is happening? It inhibited like any access to it. So suddenly it was like, no one is gonna understand, you know, that I'm talking about empathizing with space because you can't enter the picture because mm -hmm. the colors are jarring. So I found, uh, I was given by um, Joe Frost, my supervisor, uh, a list that Elizabeth Cummings, Australian painter, Elizabeth Cummings, so-called Australian painter, so-called Australia, <laughs> no painter. Um, <laughs> a list of restricted palette exercises. So I started doing that. And I realized through that process that color is essential to perception. Duh. Duh. Like, <laughs> obviously. Um, and this is not new to anybody except for me in this moment. Um, and so that's what kind of started this, you know, wheel slowly turning in my mind that like, okay, maybe color is more important than I thought. Um, and I started reading, you know, I think David Batchelor was essential to kind of my awakening to color as concept. So realizing that color Color theory was, you know, almost a parallel to ideas of empathy, in that, you know, it's and and it's one of the things that is really hard to pin down exactly why it affects us the way it does. Mm. We know it does. We know that it does heaps for us. You know, it changes our mood. Uh, it can affect us physically. Um, you know, it has much power mm. in our day to day, and you know it's used constantly to be a powerful thing. Advertising, whatever. Yeah, well, that's, I was about to say the propagandists, they've dialed, dialed that to a science. Yeah, pr precisely. And it really is. You know, it really is that kind of powerful. Mm. Um, and you know, it, it really related that idea those ideas about color being you know incredibly effective but you know difficult to kind of really articulate it articulate do you need to check that it's all right well, i'll just uh i'll just go to okay because we're trailing anyway. okay cool yeah um and so yeah i think you know i had started early on with james elkins as a you know as a um as my foundation kind of exploring you know these experiences that we have that we can't really articulate why might we come to art to do that you know and then bachelor was talking about um how you know color works similarly it's mysterious but we know that it's all powerful um and so that started to think about how like conceptually i was thinking about my use of color um, as a painter up until that point, maybe it had largely been a practical thing. Um, and yeah, I think that's where, um, you know, my use of artificial light sort of started to come in um, on, the, on the suggestion of um, one of my other supervisors, Jude Ray, uh, who 
you know, herself a fantastic painter had, you know, suggested um, as, as she has, uh, you know, experimented with and, and utilises regularly, I think, you know, um, staging light, lighting to kind of create particular, you know, uh, compositional um, intrigue, mm. interest, but it also affects the colour, right? Mm. So, in lockdown, the uh, in in twenty one, started using artificial lighting. Was like, okay, I've got to make some colourful pictures because I was making you know pictures that were quite brown and you know nice and lush, but not you know as maybe vivid as I had wanted. And really composing a picture with colour and light, of course, they're interconnected. Like you can't really separate them. Um, and realizing that it just it changed the energy, it changed the energy of the pictures. It changed the way that I was looking. Suddenly I had these shadows thanks to the lamps that I was using. Looking at the color within the shadows is just like a world to lose yourself in. Yeah. It was like a portal, it was like a vortex that I would lose myself in for hours. And it was all feeling, it was all feeling what I was seeing. It wasn't, you can't simply look at a thing and understand the complexity of the color. I can look at a thing and say, yeah, it's yellow, mm. but really it's not, really it's yellow, it's green, it's orange, there's darks in there, there's, you know, umber, there's black, there's blues, you know. Mm. And so I was then, you know, kind of thrust into a whirlpool <laughs> Um, and that's how it, yeah, I think related to the to the theory and affect and again care because it is not something that I would have recognized if I wasn't paying attention. Mm. Yeah. yeah it's my mum. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But just, I don't wanna, you know, like, no, we're just wrapping up. I was literally just about to say thank you for being on the show, Bella. Thanks so much for and having me. Thank you me. so much for the flowers. You're very welcome. Really Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Oh. What a huge feat. Mm. Yeah, you've Did done you such a feat. <laughs> <laughs> I do much better when she's not around, actually. Thanks. <laughs>